so let's let's give this a start. Can you see the shared screen? Check, check. Yeah. No. No. Blank for me. That's fine. I can see. It. I don't need to see it. I don't need to see it. My whole phone is frozen, so if it kicks me off, there you go. Okay. So um, I've tried to focus mainly on European finds from the 10th to 16th centuries. Sewing tools, thimbles, scissors, needles have been found throughout Africa and Asia and the Middle East, dating back to like many cent centuries before Common Era. Um, so we're going to go to the first slide, which is needles. Okay. Uh, sorry, the first slide is uh, kit lists. Um, okay. So this is just a, a quick rundown of the kind of things that you're going to want to have uh, in your embroidery kits and the kinds of things that we're going to be talking about as we go on today. Okay, so next slide. Okay. This, this one's needles. Um, so firstly, whatever needle you pick, is 100% personal choice. Um, there isn't a lot of difference in needles. Uh, like a Milner's needle is a long sharp, you know, and a quilter's needle is a sharp with a long eye and stuff like that, right? Like they're very small. So if you want to hand sew with an embroidery needle, you go right ahead. Um, Metal needles have been found in Europe throughout our period. Uh, the needles found are often large by our standards, like most of them fall in the two to three millimeter range. This is likely because anything finer kind of disappeared. Um, however, the excavations at Coppergate have found two needles from the 12th and 13th century levels that are especially fine, as they call them. <clears throat> so that would be uh, 0.8 and 0.9 millimeters in diameter, which is gauge 20 and 19 respectively. Um, for comparison, my favorite embroidery needle is about 21 gauge. And remember, the bigger the gauge number, the smaller or thinner the wire. <clears throat> so the needles that we found, we found iron needles, copper alloy needles and a respectable um, source, we'll call them copper alloy because we cannot tell from looking at them whether they're copper or whether they're, pause. Okay, sorry, my computer decided to jump onto the meeting right at that moment and was uh, giving a lot of echo. <clears throat> so um, a respectable source will not call them bronze or brass or copper because we can't tell the difference without interacting with them somehow and therefore destroying the needle. So copper alloy, um, brass is just as likely as bronze. Um, or they were made from organics, bone, horn, and wood. Uh, the metal needles, uh, personally, I hate bone needles. They are far too thick. Uh, so my interest lies in metal needles. Um, the eyes in the metal needles were of two types. They were round or they were long. The round ones were made with a punch, and the long eyes were made by splitting the end of the wire and soldering the tips back together. Um, Centering the eyes in either method is a pain in the neck. I know this because I've tried both. Um, so the needles that we found are clearly made by experienced craftspeople. Um, the copper gate findings show us that copper alloys with round punched eyes became more popular in the Middle Ages. Uh, and that's probably because the copper alloy is easier to work with than the iron. And punching is a simpler process. Um, it's, it's fewer steps, first of all. And uh, the sawing is much harder than just 
uh, hammering a punch through it. Um, interestingly, there were no bone needles found in the 12th to 13th century levels, but there were several in the earlier levels. Um, uh, in the slide, you have uh, an excerpt from the um, Coppergate finds in the top left. Uh, and you can see there's quite the variety. Um, they are made by flattening out the top and then making the hole through the in the flattened bit and then sharpening the other end. Um, the bottom one with the blue background uh, dates from a castle that's 13 or 14th century and it looks for all intents and purposes exactly like one of our modern needles. Uh, so on the subject of buying your needles, so there are merchants all over that sell reproduction needles. Um, they're almost exclusively the punched eye kind. Again, it's a simpler manufacturing process. Um, a word to the wise, choose iron needles when you can find them. If you buy brass needles, um, merchants love to make brass needles because then it's a copper alloy like what was found and brass is super easy to work with and super easy to find. Uh, the thing is modern brass is a little too pure so it can only be hardened by bending it. Um, and it has been my experience that most merchants don't bother to harden their needles. Uh, it will, they bend very easily. They don't keep a point worth a damn and you will be frustrated. So I highly recommend not buying bronze needles or brass needles. Um, I have made a bronze needle myself out of 21 gauge bronze wire. Um, and, and if my video worked, I would show it to you. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, it's perfectly sharp. It's easy to thread. Um, both bronze and silver can be hardened by hammering them. So that makes them easy to harden. So if you're looking to, uh, to make your own, I recommend um, bronze. Uh, and I'm going to add a page with um, shopping recommendations for anyone who wants to go ahead and, and do that. Um, okay, next slide. So now that we've talked about needles, we need to talk about how to keep them. Um, needles are precious. Uh, they're easy to lose. So we need needle keepers. And I mean, like, modernly, we still use needle keepers. Um, the Norse favored open-ended tubes, the one on the left, uh, bronze, silver, bone, whatever, um, a, a chicken bone, a small bird bone, is super easy to turn into a needle holder because it's already got the hole in it. Uh, so the needles were kept in place by embedding them in like a scrap of fabric and then stuffing the fabric into the tube and then the friction kept the fabric in the tube. Um, in the middling centuries, we moved to capped tubes. Um, copper alloys need less oiling and less care when storing. They don't tarnish as much. Um, so you don't need to put them in uh, like wool. Uh, so you needed some way to keep them in the tube, right? So this is where the capping comes in. Uh, they do benefit from some fluff in the bottom. Uh, the roving, the fluff, whatever, gives the needle something to like catch onto in the middle of the tube. So they don't then stick to the sides of the tube and make them impossible to get out. Um, I, I was gifted a reproduction made by Cesare in, um, in like one of those autocrat boxes. And I put my needles in it right away and I swear I put four in and I could only get three out. 
<laughs> so um, I did some cleaning and, and found the fourth needle. So I shoved a um, cotton ball, actually, in the bottom. Uh, not super period, but no one can see it. Uh, so speaking of care of your needles, um, I, you know, I said the copper alloy needs less oiling. It doesn't tarnish, tarnish as much. Um, so you're going to want to wipe your needle down before you put it away because our skin oils are corrosive. Um, and again, if you're using iron needles, you're going to want to, uh, store them in something kind of greasy not not like super greasy because then you would also have to wipe them down before you start sewing um but like just enough and it's hard to explain what just enough is um this is a great point to mention that you can get lanolin cream like um a gel at the pharmacy in the baby section and it's just 100 percent lanolin um, um. So all needles eventually lose their sharpness, which Mona Laura can attest to. Um, the difference between now and then is that now we've either lost the needle because they're so cheap we don't care, or, well, we just throw it out because they're so cheap we don't care. Um, the plating on modern needles makes it hard to sharpen because you're going to take away all the plating, and then that causes problems of its own. Um, so it really just isn't worth it to sharpen a stainless steel needle. Uh, period needles, on the other hand, you, you know, if you buy one, a set of three for five bucks, you're not throwing them out just because they've lost their sharpness. Also, they'll probably lose their sharpness before you're done sewing your dress. Um, so what you want to do is have a whetstone in your sewing kit. Um, as you draw the, the needle away from the point you also kind of want to roll it and that will help you sharpen that's how you sharpen a needle on a whetstone um they found whetstones in with the sewing tools they had holes and bales to be hung from probably brooches uh don't go out and buy a pretty looking wet stone from a merchant. It's probably just any old stone. Go to Lee Valley, get a proper wet stone. It doesn't matter that it's a giant square block. This is the advice I got from Stylart, so you know it's good. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, I, yes. Sorry, uh, MLO. Um, as Dan was just saying, would fleece with lanolin work to stuff inside of the needle case? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you want to make sure it's a nice tight stuffing because um, like when you park a needle in fabric, it's pretty secure. Um, the, the fluff, the, the, the rovings, um, are just a little bit looser. So you want to make sure that you get as much in there as possible to make sure the friction coefficient is as high as possible. Um, I didn't talk about 16th century needle cases. Um, they innovated. So they took their wooden bobbins, which we will talk about in a second, um, and drilled a hole down the center and stuck their needles in the middle of their bobbins, which is... Uh, efficient and minimalist and all of those wonderful things. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's move on to the next slide and uh, talk about pins next. So pins. Um, pins are less necessary when hand sewing than when using a machine. Um, and Mona Laura disagrees with the use of pins entirely. Um, I find they do come in handy. <laughs> uh, there are so many pins that have this like coiled ball at the top that museums don't even bother to put them in their collection databases. So like the only way that you'll find pictures of period needles of period pins is like uh, Rosalie Gilbert. Um, she went to the museum and took a picture of a sewing kit that was on display, but the, um, 
the the museum she went to doesn't have that sewing kit or any of those pins in their online database. They're just not important enough. Um, uh, the pins are copper alloy, again, very easy to use, don't tarnish as much. Um, there have been a couple found in silver, but in my opinion, silver would have been used for clothing for the more well-to-do people, because then you would see them. Um, and the, the copper alloy would be saved for the sewing kit. Um, today we have pin cushions with emery in them. To keep the pins sharp, uh, I've only ever had cheap pin cushions, so I don't ever, like I haven't had one with emery, but I'm told that the strawberry on your tomato is full of emery. Um, I am not aware of any pin cushions having been found in our period, but emery is a documented substance for sanding and shining metalwork. Uh, Theopolis mentioned it. Uh, so it's not out of the realm of possibility that they took fabric, stuffed it with emery, and then used this to shine and polish both their needles and their pins. Um, what it looks like is your guess is as good as mine. Um, I have seen emery for sale at a shop in Ottawa, um, and I'm pretty sure I've seen it online. So it's an achievable substance. Uh, let us go to the next slide where we will talk about thread. Well, more bobbins. Anyway, thread. So uh, thread is less interesting than the tool that holds it. Uh, the content of the thread is what we all expect, linen, silk, maybe sometimes wool, cotton, if you're in a later period or a more easterly persona. Um, Bobbins. Bobbins are really cool. Again, there are not a whole lot of pictures online of egg stamp bobbins uh, before, well, just we'll leave it at that. Um, in the Viking period, like the 9 through 11 centuries, they liked flat things with notches. Um, on the slide, there's a little, I don't even know how to describe that shape but it came out of a burka grave. It's bone. You wrap the, the thread around it. It looks an awful lot like those DMC plastic cards, except the DMC ones are plastic and have some uh, extra notches. Um, the middling centuries went more to the long ones that are on the left. Um, those three are bone. And they were probably done on a lathe. Um, that doesn't mean that there weren't wooden ones. I believe the London series books, the, the Museum of London book called um, Medieval Household, uh, which is somewhere in the mail, um, mentions a wooden bobbin. Um, based on these, I was able to get two different... Uh, woodworkers to make bobbins, um, which I am super pleased with and can't show you because my video isn't working. Um, I use the hand carved, longer, tiny ones that Duncan carved for my embroidery floss, and I find it works way better than the flat plastic DMC ones. Um, the thread clings to it, I don't need those extra notches. Um, and they're super pretty. Um, so uh, we see once again the 16th century bobbin, which looks like any standard spool you could imagine today, two of them stuck together, and then it has that hole drilled down the center for your needles. So that's a like, super efficient tool, and I'm a little jealous of the 16th century. Um, so linen thread needs to be waxed, right? Um, thread is delicate and it can, like it frays and it knots and it, it just generally misbehaves. And if you're using linen thread, you just pass it over a cake of wax a couple of times and this will strengthen it, it will lubricate it, and it will keep it from fraying too much at the working end. Um, a Coppergate 
uh, excavations actually found a small ball of beeswax with the sewing tools. And like, it's, it's a common um, SCA event site token because it's useful for all kinds of things like archers wax their bows armors leather all kinds of things um for a sewer a small like two ounce ball will last you forever you could hand sew garb for the entire kingdom and not use it up um so uh it's it also I like it because it, it means fewer knots. Um, in, when embroidering, however, you don't want to cake the whole length of your floss with wax because um, it'll dull the look of the silk. Uh, but sometimes it's beneficial to wax the loose end. So you've got the knot on one end and then you've got the, the bit tail hanging out through the, through the needle, that loose end. Um, because of the way floss is so loosely spun, it it frays and it feathers and it just sort of slowly disappears. So if you put some wax or uh, modern thread conditioner on it, that is less likely to happen. And it will be helpful to uh, rethread your needle later when it comes out, because it will, because threads like that. Um, okay, next slide. Thimbles. Thimbles are super important. You need a symbol and I hate them. Um, like a million and one thimbles have been found everywhere and half of all portraits of tailors depict them they are they are PPE for sewers um, so we've found ring style we found your traditional looks vaguely like a, a, a tumbler only thimble sized um, so it's flat on top and more or less conical otherwise, like a truncated henin. Um, and then we found a whole bunch of kind of curvy domed ones, like the two Spanish ones that are on your, your slide. Um, I wouldn't know which one works best. Uh, the important thing is that it covers the part that you push with, right? Uh, my problem with thimbles is that I can't feel anything through them. And so I, it's like having a giant Band-Aid on my working finger. I'll just use a different finger, which makes the thimble pointless. Um, so I have trained myself to use a modern silicone thimble uh, because I can feel just enough that I don't automatically switch to another finger. Um, and it gives me just enough protection uh, to make it worthy. Uh, with embroidery, you don't usually use thimbles. Um, there are two kinds of uh, strategies for making your embroidery stitches. You could stab. So you, you stab the needle down and pull the thread and then stab the needle up with your other hand. And for those, you don't need thimbles. But if you're using a like stitch, like you're taking a stitch style of of laying your threads, you are going to want something um, on the part of your finger that is pushing the needle. But you don't want to like cover your whole finger. Um, I use uh, suede stickers. They're called thimblets. Um, I had to order them special because apparently I'm the only one in the world who still uses them. Um, but I stick them right on the part that I push with and callous or not, uh, it, it improves my life. Um, again, thimble choice is personal choice. You need to find one that you can work with. And if that's a weird quilting thimble or whatever, like go for it. Um, you can have a reproduction ring style thimble in your kit for show, but if if it's not protecting you the way that you sew, then it's, it's no good for you. It, it's just decorative. So uh, let's move on to snips and scissors, which is way more fun than thimbles. Um, so next slide, please, Gina. 
so both snips and scissors or shears are important in your sewing kit. Um, the shears are often too big to cut the thread nicely at the end of a seam. So that's why you want the snips. And the snips aren't good enough to like cut the neck hole out if, if that's what you're going to be doing at the event, right? Um, so scissors have been found in all sizes, in all locations, both the spring type, uh, like the Italian scissors in the middle, um, and the pivoted type, which are what people mostly think of when you say scissors. Um, <coughs> they were an important innovation in history because uh, scissors do jobs that knives can't. Scissors do jobs better than knives can't. You know all those movies where they take a knife and they cut the rope? That's, that, that doesn't happen. You can't cut an, a rope with a knife like that. You kind of need scissors. Um, and, you know, like there's sheep need to be sheared and nails need to be cut and hair and all that kind of stuff. So not all scissors are necessarily sewing scissors. Um, so most of the ones that have been found are iron although there are a few silver examples. Um, some of the silver examples that I've seen are like Korean or Chinese, they're Asian, and they're super pretty. Like they're Neelio or they're enameled or they're, you know, all that kind of stuff. Those are probably decorative um, because why would you risk ruining the decoration by actually using them, right? Um, the shape of scissors are remarkably similar to modern scissors, right? Like if you look at the pictures on the presentation, you, you, there is no way to know that some of these aren't modern scissors, except the ones that actually say that they're modern. Um, you know, our, our sewing shears have many ergonomic developments, you know, different sized finger holes with squishy padding and, you know, angled blades so that you could cut forever, right? But the concept is the same. Um, blades held together with a pin, and finger holes. Um, if you're looking to have period looking scissors in your kit, Lee Valley is the place to go. Um, they have the little spring shear scissors that come like a, d a dozen for ten dollars or something if you can get them um those are still really popular like with beading you can get them at beading stores and cross stitch stores um but lee valley has them cheapest and if you get like a whole dozen then you can have a pair in every uh sewing kit right um and then they have a set of three or four uh Japanese scissors I think they're called um and I mean the shape is has been found in period and they are iron so go for it um and they cut pretty well um so our illuminations support our physical finds both spring and pivot style scissors are represented in all sizes um so if you look at the, at the presentation on the right-hand side, it's 16th century German illumination of tailor scissors, how they're like triangle shaped, the blades. Um, so the bulky angular blade uh, is likely there to give some rigidity to the edge. Uh, so, Cause without the bulk, it might bend and, and mess up the, the cut and ruin the scissors. So modern alloys and metalworking have let us just have some nice thin uh, blades without losing the rigidity. Um, for embroidery, you rarely need large shears, uh, but those little uh, spring style scissors are kind of perfect. Um, they are the only thing I have used in all of my years of embroidery. Um, 
I have only recently purchased modern embroidery scissors. You can see pictures of them on the deck um, because they're just so pretty. Uh, those are the smallest and the largest embroidery scissors that uh, Chelsea Buns, who is here in Ottawa, sells. Um, and they're pretty and I like touching them, um, but they're not in my kit. <laughs> Uh, so they're wicked sharp embroidery scissors and they come to like a terrific point. Uh, this is for ripping out stitches if you've made a mistake. Um, I recommend not ever actually doing that, but that's besides the point. Um, and like sometimes you pull fluff up from the back um, because there's like lots of ends back there when you're using a bunch of different colors. So embroidery scissors are really nice for getting really close to the stitching without ruining anything. Um, so we have found uh, scissors with cases, both the silver embroidery scissors in the left and the Italian scissors in the middle have cases. Um, and we have an illumination of scissors in cases in, in a sheath. Um, and you definitely want to keep some of your scissors in sheaths. Um, embroidery scissors with their wicked point are good in sheaths or you want to hang some heavy dongle from the finger holes because when you drop them, uh, you want them to land on their finger holes, not on the point. Because if it lands on the point, that's bad for the scissors and it's bad for the floor. Um, and my Lee Valley shears are so pointy that they just, they go through everything. So I've had, uh, Tanikin, uh, a local here, she's made me a little sheath and there is documentary, uh, support for that. So you should go ahead and do it. Um, so next slide, please. If anybody has any questions, please like scream. Um, my video is completely turned off. Like I can't, I'm not getting a video feed and, uh, I am not seeing the chat. So it's I'm, pretty quiet. I've been keeping an eye on it. <laughs> thanks Emilo. Okay. So we were going on to other sewing tools. So this is a German 16th century portrait. Um, in your traveling kit, you might want chalk. Um, you probably want something that measures. Uh, illuminations show both flexible measuring tapes and rigid rulers. I chose one with a flexible measuring tape. <coughs> rigid rulers of any useful length are um, hard to transport. Uh, so you want a flexible tape and those, um, you know, those bubble tape type measuring tapes that we all have. They're a little um, obvious. Uh, so to improve upon that, you can take a piece of, you know, beige uh, twill tape or gross grain ribbon or something. So the ends finished um, so that you have a nice straight line to work with. And then just write the gradations on it yourself. Use ink. Don't be afraid of the Sharpie. I've said that already, haven't I? Um, and, you know, one that's 40 inches is probably useful enough. Um, I might prefer one that's more along the high lines of 100 inches because as fat, and if I'm going to be measuring myself, I need more than 40 inches. Um, Awls are super useful if you want to do lacing holes or buttonholes or whatevers. Um, illuminations do show compasses and knives, although I'm not sure how useful they would be. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it just as um, buttonhole chisels. Or, pink or is ink. that, or is that a 16th century thing? It's mostly a 16th century thing. Um, I am certain that the long buttonholes were cut. Constance, yes. What would a compass be used for in a sewing kit? I haven't a clue. 
Well, um, if it tailors, it'd be patterning. Yeah, making arcs like for a neck hole or an armhole. They didn't have French curves like we do. Oh, that kind of compass. Okay, sorry. Oh, I was thinking of yes. pointing north compass. <laughs> compass, not orienteering compass. Um, embroidery frames and stands. Next slide, please. This is one of my favorite slides. Um, so every one of the frames that we see on this slide is what is called a slate frame. If you are looking to buy one of these L S L A T E slate frame, um, they're expensive, especially for what they, they have a lot of workmanship in them, which is why they would be expensive because they are basically four rulers with holes drawn in them uh, for uh, four pieces of wood that are about the length and thickness and size of a yardstick. They don't have gradations on them. Um, and you drill holes in them and then you peg them together at the size that you need and then you sew your fabric onto them with a nice thick linen thread. Uh, this holds your fabric taut and away you go. Um, the top right shows four people transferring patterns onto fabric. Um, they are, two are using the light behind the fabric method and two are using prick and pounce. Um, all of these are held up by trestles of some sort. No, that's a lie. Most of these are held up by trestles of some sort. They're the same trestles that you use for the table. Trestles are super portable because you just pop them apart, throw them in a bag. Um, the fellow at his workstation has attached two support arms to his table um, and has laid his, his work on top of that. And then you can, I think he might actually be beating uh, because you can see like a, a round dish on the on the work next to the scissors. So I, my assumption is that he's beating. Um, there are plenty of reasons why you might want to use a different kind of frame when you are stitching. Um, I like the wooden frame that you tack to, just because I like it. Um, I have some trestles uh, and I have an easel type stand that you will see nowhere else because Duncan made it for me personally. <laughs> he will make you one too if you want. Um, uh, it is everything I need. You should find a stand that works for you is what I'm saying. Um, I would like to add that if you look at the, the dude in his workshop in the center picture, uh, you will note that there is a cat on the floor. It is vital it is a, a very important tool to have a studio cat for your stitching because otherwise you wouldn't experience the full range of suffering that you need to in life. <laughs> um, three, three of them are even better. Yes. The more, the better. My mind passes in front of me on the couch under the stand and knocks important pieces of the stand out. It's great. And I'm just waiting for the cat to jump up on at there and knock the beads off. Oh. The... Yep. Oh. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Never get too uh, <laughs> proud of yourself. Um, so the last thing that we absolutely need in a sewing kit. Next slide, please, Gina. We're going to talk about containers. Um, you know, I'm sure we all have a, like a little bag sometimes that we just keep our sewing kit in. Um, I have one. That is, in fact, the main reason why I got um, the leather sheath for my scissors, because the scissors were poking out of the weave of the bag. Um, that's fine. Like, I'm not saying anything. I'm, I'm not passing judgment. You use what you want. Um, if you want some ideas, here are some ideas. Uh, so we haven't really found boxes with tools in them or the archaeologists didn't think this was important and didn't record it. 
Uh, illuminations, however, do show tools in open baskets, often on the floor next to what they're, you know, they're just sitting on a bench and uh, there's a little basket um, and the scissors are sticking out. Uh, for our purposes, because we're talking about kits that travel with us to events because you know why wouldn't we just use our modern tools at home we need uh, something with a lid uh so many 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 illuminations show these thin oval boxes okay they're called bent wood boxes like so they steam the wood and put it around a form in order to make the oval um, a lot of the illuminations are depictions of women's bed chambers. So you could assume that they are sewing kits. Um, the, the best looking one, the one on the top left, that's a detail from a, an illumination, a painting of, uh, I think Jesus's birth because the baby has a halo. Um, so all of these paintings with uh, midwives and babies have these bent wood boxes somewhere tucked under a bench or the bed or something. Um, so they're a great, they're a great option. Uh, there's even a 15th century Italian painted box that the Met Museum has. Um, it says it's canvas and wood and paint. So it might be like the wooden box and then covered with canvas that is then painted like the guys do with their shields. Um, I've also seen boxes for religious doohickeys called corporals. It's basically a placemat. Um, and it's covered in embroidery, German brick stitch to be particular. So you could totally take a box and cover it with embroidery. It's a thing. You could do it. Um, if you want to just go out and buy a box, you want to look for shaker bentwood box. Because if you don't have shaker in there, you're going to get a whole lot of uh, indigenous art, which is great, but not what we're looking for. Um, there have also been like a whole bunch of thicker wood boxes that are like nailed together that have been painted and carved and, and all sorts of things. One is specifically for game pieces, so it has uh, divisions in it, uh, which may be useful to you in your sewing kit. I don't know. It may not be. Uh, but really, the sky's the limit. Um, there are some lidded baskets in some paintings. Those typically have fabric rolls, probably bandages. Um, but lidded baskets did exist. And therefore, if you want to put your sewing kit in it, go for it. Um, Excuse me. Can I? Uh, we got go yes. about three minutes left. Oh, uh, dear. Yes. So. Okay. Um, I will then skip the modern embroidery goodies um, and uh, just ask if there are any questions. And if not, um, my email's on the documents, so feel free to send me an email. Uh, I